Okay, this is Brother Watkins, and I am going to do this video to kind of recap our lecture of February 10th, Friday, uh, in which I am talking about uh, the revenue recognition matching principle, accrual accounting, and how to do adjusting entries. So before we talk about anything complicated, you need to know why we're doing it. And we do it because there are two different kinds of income measurements two different kinds of accounting. There's cash basis, and in cash basis accounting, nothing happens until you have money in your hands. I can do all kinds of work for people. I can buy all kinds of things on credit, but I don't book the transaction until I have cash. So that means if I pay for something that's going to benefit me for three or four years, then it's an expense the minute I pay for it. And this is how we do our taxes. If I buy a, uh, let's see, the limit is $50,000, so if I buy a $10,000 asset, I can expense it right away in that year, even though it may last me for five or six years. If I receive cash, I have income the minute I receive it. It doesn't matter if I did the work years ago or not. A cash basis accounting system is simple. It doesn't ask difficult questions. It just asks you when you got the cash and when you paid the cash. And the reason for this is it's easier to verify. Can you imagine uh, trying to verify uh, for an individual the kind of information that a publicly traded company must verify? We'd all have to hire our own auditors and get an approval on our own personal finances before we could file our taxes. So instead, uh, the world of public accounting and the world you're about to enter, whenever you do financial statements, we use accrual basis accounting. Accrual basis accounting deals with two principles. The first principle is that your revenue is recognized when it is earned, whether or not you are paid cash for it at the time. As you know, you can receive uh, a promise to pay that counts for exactly the same thing as cash does. They're both assets and they both uh, constitute revenue when, when they're earned. The matching principle simply says if I have an expense, I recognize that expense in the period in which those costs are going to provide benefit. So any kind of expense you can imagine, uh, it is the job of the accountant to allocate that expense or to make sure that the expense is applied carefully to match when it was uh, providing benefit. Now if you think that this is simple, uh, I imagine that somewhere in Salt Lake City there is a report that says for each student at BYU Hawaii the costs of running this university are X dollars per student. Now how do they come up with that number? I couldn't tell you. Uh, but they put a lot of work into it and what they have to do is they have to add up all the various costs of running this place and then divide it up by how many students we have. In fact that is one reason why the university is developing the way it is so that the costs of this university can be spread over more students. So the trick is, how do you allocate costs? And that's what I want you to develop a skill in, is figuring out how do I break up one large payment so that I can look at it in different time periods. For our quiz today, I gave you an example where a company pays a $12,000 bill to buy one year's insurance coverage and they pay for that insurance coverage on the first day of November in 2011. Now here's a pie chart I did just to get you the idea that what you have to do is you have to cut this expense into two pieces. One piece applies to the year ending 2011 and the other piece ends in 2012. And you could see that the program helpfully told me that I have 17 percent of that bill that is going in 2011 and 83 that's going in 2012. Uh, this doesn't really visualize it for your financial statements. Uh, it would be hard to read financial statements that consisted of a bunch of pie charts like this. So what we do is we take a look at our timeline. Remember all of your accounting is designed to be consistent so that when I look at one year's operations from one company to the next I know that we're looking at 12 months. A company can select different months but essentially 
the, the business world runs in terms of years. Interest rates are given in, in annual amounts and earnings are typically cited uh, in annual amounts unless they're, they're quarterly, but quarterly earnings are always kind of estimated. So how are we going to uh, come up with a way to divide this insurance expense and put it in our books? And uh, let me give you a different picture. Okay, what I did here is I created a timeline and the color will represent a year and I just arbitrarily started in August. So we'll just pretend that August is 2011 and then my 2012 year is going to be in green and then when I get to 2013 I'm looking in orange 2014 is in blue. Just a sliding scale here, just a way to visualize that I've got all these months okay and so now what I want to do is I want to put our our problem uh, superimpose it on this and then explain how to solve it so here's our problem the company purchases a policy of insurance it's good for a year the insurance policy cost twelve thousand and was purchased in November of uh, 2012 the first thing you do uh, and the first thing all accountants do when they see a problem like this is they ask themselves does that expense being that insurance policy uh, have to do with more than one time period or one reporting period and of course it does I told you that it's good for a year and the second question that you ask if it's good for one year how do we divide it up so that we can recognize how much of it applies to year 2012 and how much applies to year 2013. Uh, I went back through the video I realized that I called the yellow 2011 so change that. The yellow is now 2012 and so what we're going to do is we're going to figure out how do we spread the cost of that insurance policy over these various months. So what you do first is you say okay this insurance goes over uh, two time periods that we're going to be concerned about. It applies to two time periods so what's the quickest way to spread that around? I think the quickest way is monthly. So let me bring that. And monthly expenses are probably going to be the easiest for you to uh, apportion. You're going to have daily expenses. Uh, and as we talked about in class, you could even have expenses that have their own schedule to show that 10% this month and 20% next month. But the point is, you ask yourself, do I have to apportion this cost? And yes, you do. So now we have to go and apply the expense. We have to figure out exactly where it's going to go. And the way you do that is just as simple as mapping it across to some kind of calendar. And I know some of you already get this, but bear with me because I'm trying to make it um, graphically visible to everybody else. Okay, what I've done is I've come along and I've put the $1,000 per month because insurance is the same benefit to you uh, throughout its lifetime. It doesn't change. Uh, it's not more valuable in some months than in other months. So I was able to put just a straight 1000 here in November, December, January, February, and so on until we get to a total of 12000 which is the amount that we purchased. So when you see that, hopefully in your mind you're saying, okay, those yellow months are going to go on one income statement and the green months are going to go on another income statement. And how do we handle that? And you handle that with adjusting entries at the end of the period. Now, let's uh, change, uh, change gears real quick and go to a discussion of real versus nominal accounts. Here is a uh, graphic I did for you that shows the accounting uh, tree of life, as it were. The assets equal liabilities plus owner's equity expanded equation. You should be able to see this in your sleep. And what we're looking at, I drew a line for you. And everything on top of that line is a balance sheet account. Those are real accounts. And by real, they last. They're permanent. They're part of your business forever. You can't just say, hey, I've decided to redo my capital. I'm going to start over. You can't do that because accounting has a going concern assumption. However, nominal accounts, those accounts that are under the line, those are temporary accounts. Those accounts, net income, dividends, will only collect 
uh, information that pertains to the period in which you're, you're doing your income statement. So you're going to have revenues, expenses, and dividend accounts. And at the end of the period, you're going to close those accounts up. And you're going to take all of the, all of the entries that you had, and you're going to make them part of your retained earnings. You're going to close the revenues, then you close the expenses, and whatever's left over, including uh, left, less the dividends, is going to be your retained earnings entry. And you're going to increase or you're going to decrease your retained earnings, which is a concept that's roughly equivalent to your net income. Uh, you're just going to figure out how much that, that business made, how much you distributed in dividends, and uh, I think that's all review for you. So in order to do that correctly, you have to make sure that you're looking at the right amount in these nominal accounts. So let's go back up to our example here. We'll adjust this. Okay, now start by looking at the two approaches. Remember what happened at the very beginning. Your insurance policy cost 12000 and you purchased it on November 1st of 2012. A good accountant would recognize that on November 1st you bought something that has value entirely in the future and they would book the entire outlay of cash to an account called prepaid insurance. Remember cash goes out with a debit and prepaid insurance being another asset goes up with a debit. So what you've done when you bought the insurance was you've created an asset that's going to provide uh, benefits to your company in the future. So if you start with the asset approach, then your adjusting entry, right down here, is going to consist of recognizing how much insurance expense did we really have in our year 2012. Well, let's go up, uh, excuse me here, if we go up so that you can see it, you've got November and December. All these other months, those pertain to a completely different year. So, because we booked it right as prepaid insurance of 12 and cash, cash out of 12, your adjusting entry simply says, let's recognize $2,000 as the insurance expense for 2012. And then, because every journal entry has to have a corresponding credit, you say, well, what's really happening when we take the expense? And your only uh, options are, you either paid cash right then, and then you'd, you'd offset your cash by 2000 but you know that you already bought the insurance. And so you look through your books and you realize, aha, I've got a prepaid insurance account up here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take 2000 out of that prepaid insurance account. Remember, when you have two accounts like this, you draw your T and you have 12000 on one side and 2000 on the other. And that means your balance in prepaid insurance is 10000 at the end of the year, which is an asset. It's just like cash in the bank. And your insurance expense is going to be 2000 The object is to end your year with $2,000 of insurance expense. And you say, how do we know that? You know that because you cut it all up and you analyzed and you decided that 2000 applies to 2012 and then 10000 will apply to 2013. Because 10000 applies to uh, 2013, you're then in 2013, oh, I've got an error here, let me correct that. Your 2013 adjusting entry, sorry, your 2013 adjusting entry is going to be to recognize all of this. And so you're going to say, well, I'm still carrying an asset on my books of prepaid insurance. You go back here and you see that up here. So then in order to recognize my insurance expense for 2013, I book the expense, and expenses always go up with credit, or sorry, expenses go up with debits, and then I credit the asset. Now, that assumes that you didn't buy any more insurance since November 1st, 2011. But I just wanted to show you that when you booked that asset in 2012, you created a prepaid account that's going to have benefit in two years. So you're going to have two different adjusting entries, and you're going to have to figure out a way to make sure that you're booking your insurance correctly. If I had bought $100,000 of insurance on November 1st, 2012, let's just say that my insurance agent said, if you buy 10 years worth of insurance, I'll give it to you for half price. Well, great. Then we'll have this prepaid insurance account that we're going to be dipping into for 10 years. 
But the point is, whenever you get down to preparing your income statement at the end of the year, you have to adjust your accounts to properly reflect the, the expenses that were incurred in that period. Now we've just talked about the asset approach, but there's another way to book this transaction. Okay, so let's go back up here. Just What you've done is you've purchased an insurance policy that costs 12000 So the other way to do it uh, is going to be as follows. When you bought that insurance and you paid that $12,000, your bookkeeper could just as legitimately have said, oh, we paid $12,000 for some insurance. And he may have booked it or she may have booked it as insurance expense. Okay, This is called the expense approach. That would be the entry. If you take the expense approach, then what you have to do at the end of the year is you have to recognize, wait a minute, I didn't have $12,000 of expense in 2012. That's the yellow year. I only had $2,000. So I'm going to have to take that expense down. The way you do that is to credit insurance expense. That will take that insurance expense down by $10,000 to a balance of $2,000. And when the balance is $2,000, you're correct. But what do I do for the offsetting entry? Well, you're going to have to create the prepaid insurance asset that nobody created earlier. And you ask, how do I remember all of this? Just remember that if you have an expense that's overstated, you simply have to balance it. You have to take it down. And so this was a debit, so your, your taking it down has to be a credit. And then you think, I need something to balance this, this credit. Well, I'll put a debit here to prepaid insurance, and you create that asset. This is why double entry accounting has lasted for over 500 years. Uh, and the, the, there's this quote by the German philosopher Goethe, where he said that accounting is a perfect system. And it, it, it is perfect because it just works so well. And it works well because the rules are simple. You're going to understand them after, a, after one class. So the adjusting entry for 2012 for the expense approach is to reduce your insurance expense to what was really going on. Now, the next year is going to be similar to your asset approach because in 2012 you created that prepaid insurance and now you're going to use it all up in 2013. That's how to do the prepaid expense. Now, if you're not, if you're not getting the concept of why we have to split this up, um, hit Brother Nimro's video again because you really need to understand that of this total 12000 that you spent, 2000 benefited the, the first year, 10000 benefited the second year. So these, these uh, journal entries we're talking about are just about dividing that up so that we correctly match our expenses to the period that they benefited. Right now, let's do a, a more complicated one that I did on the board, and I had a lot of people looking at me. And that is the situation where you have a revenue that is recognized over a couple periods. Okay, here's an example of uh, how you adjust for a revenue. And I want you, instead of doing an asset approach, expense approach, in revenues we have a liability approach and a revenue approach. It's, it's basically the same thing on the other side of the equation. So we receive a monthly rent of $1,000 on the 14th day of December 2012. And on that day we realize, okay, we've got $1,000. How do we book it in? Uh, we're going to book it in as cash. And if we're doing it right on the liability approach, you see right here, it's unearned rent. We have $1,000 of rent revenue we haven't earned yet, so we book it and then you uh, do the adjustment later. So how do we do the adjustment? Well, you first ask, does it apply to more than one period? Yes, it does. It was paid in the middle of December and that person doesn't owe you rent again until the middle of January. So this revenue does need to be recognized uh, over two periods. How can I break the revenue up? Well, typically rent is earned by day, so a daily rate seems like it works. Uh, you would use $33.33 under this example to divide $1,000 into 30 days. You could come up with anything you want. It has to be consistent, but this is where the art of accounting steps in. You have to justify it as a fair way to apportion your costs. 
and if you come up with some uh, difficult rule, it's going to cost your business time. Remember, accounting is always subject to that pervasive constraint, is how long is it going to take us to apply the rule you came up with. So keep your rules simple. Uh, here we just applied a daily rate, and then we came down and we said there's 17 days of rent in December, and there's 13 days of rent in January. So let's uh, do the math, and we turn out that uh, 566.61 would be the amount that was actually earned in 2012. Again, the way you choose to divide it needs to be supported by some kind of reasonable rule, but uh, it can be anything. Okay, so I'm using it for this for this problem, but I want you to understand that anything that's fair uh, is and will be used in in the real world. So here's the uh, the way to approach it. We're coming up on our year end for 2012. We know that we took in some unearned unearned rent because we look at our trial balance and we see this unearned rent on our books. So, so we take that unearned rent and we have to adjust it. And if we look at what's going on here, we look at our unearned rent account. Unearned rent is a liability and we have a credit balance of a thousand in unearned rent. We want to reduce that liability to 433 because we've actually earned in our uh, 2012 we've earned 567 so what we do is we're going to recognize the revenue which is a credit balance and you come over here to this T and see at the end of the day my rent revenue is correct for 2012 I've got 567 and my unearned rent which is going to be applied to the next year is 433 that's how I split it up using the liability approach now I'm going to show you what would happen if you if you did the revenue approach. Okay, in the revenue approach, the check came in and you just booked it to revenue. So you now have, if you look at your T account in revenue, you have a thousand dollar credit in rent revenue, and that's going to be incorrect when you come down to the end of the year and you realize, wait a minute, I only actually earned five hundred and sixty seven in this year. So that's what my account should be and in order to to take that thousand to 567 you need to put a debit of 433 into the rent revenue which has the effect of decreasing the rent revenue from the thousand that you booked to the 567 that's appropriate and what when you've done that you have a corresponding credit so we know we need to do a debit to rent revenue but what's the credit to and here is where you're going to have to create that unearned rent category of 433. Okay, so if you look, you basically have done the same thing as in the liability approach. Here's the liability approach. And you've ended up with 567 and 433. But the liability approach makes a little more sense because when you, when you received the rent of 1,000, that's when you created the unearned rent. Okay. Most of you are probably going to look at this math up here for this rent revenue and you'll see that that revenue approach can give you kind of a backwards way of thinking because even though I see 433 here, what is really being entered in 2012's books is 1000 minus 433 or 567. Let's put that in bold. Okay. That 567 is my rent revenue. And if I use the liability approach, come down here, then I would have at some point a straight credit to rent revenue for 567. It would be a little easier to understand what's going on. But remember, it's an adjusting entry. So at the end of the day, what's important is what's in my rent revenue account? 567. What's in my unearned rent? 433. And those numbers correspond to the division that I came up with between December and January. So this is how you do, uh, how you apply the revenue recognition principle and the matching principle. Uh, we've gone through both approaches, and you should be comfortable with the idea of making sure that your nominal accounts, that would be a good time to take a quick look at the nominal accounts, which are anything under that red line, your dividends, your revenues and expenses, 
uh, you understand that those accounts at the end of the period are going to disappear. They're going to be closed out using a closing entry and they're going to close out to your uh, income summary or retained earnings account. And we'll be doing that on Monday. But if you are having trouble with this apportionment, please practice. I gave you some, uh, some uh, problems that you can use and an answer for the closing entries and it even has a, uh, a T-square overview to show you how the expenses and the dividends and the revenues all get balanced out at the very end of the uh, period. So aloha, good luck with that. Email me if you have any questions. Okay, one last thing. Uh, there's a bit of a problem on the video as I posted it, so I'm going to repost it. And at 11 minutes and 38 seconds, I said that cash goes uh, up with the credit. No, cash goes up with the debit, but I think you know that. So we're going to try and get this thing posted.